Hello, today's talk is about the implications of a third method for determining the Rydberg constant. This is done as a physical limit, not as Rydberg infinity, as in the textbook in his original paper, but instead as the maximum harmonics of all those spectrum waves getting limited to a physical distance, the particle edge for every element. Now, here's the two existing ways. It has a lot of factors in it. Ryberg infinity is the mass of electron times the charge of an electron to the fourth power. And then we have this abstract constant, which is the electric constant. Then we have Planck's constant to the cube and the speed of light. Okay, that's a lot of factors. Okay, and it's true that eventually get that, but understand there's another one. It also uses the fine structure constant and the Bohr radius. Again, gets to the same number, but it uses alpha, which I will explain later, has a physical meaning. Then four pi, well, that's a, a round circle, two pi, times the radius of an, uh, the, the distance between the electron and the proton in a basic hydrogen atom, okay? A sub O, okay? Now those have multiple inputs and those are important because as you move them, then you can determine other elements. However, that effort to date has failed. It's failed because they don't know what they're comparing against. So unless it's a noble gas, these methods don't work. Okay, they have differences that are material enough to make your spectrum off by 10, 20%, which is makes a green, a red, and uh, different colors. Okay, my solution has a different way, and that is it's based upon the particle size itself, the radius of the electron or the proton, but the, the physical radius. Now that's about 2.81 uh, times 10 to the minus 16 meters. Okay. It is the radius of electron and it is a physical radius. It's not the Compton radius and some other ones. If you go in your textbook, there's like six radiuses. I have chosen one that I believe fits the physical one. So we know what Ryberg is. It's a set of spectrum lines and we've seen these spectrum lines and basically Ryberg and then Bohr basically put together these lines based upon one over one integer squared minus one over a second integer squared, and you get these spacings. And obviously, as that n squares becomes 10, 20, 30, 40, these become closer and closer in tellers. And Ryberg and Bohr both said, well, good. Eventually, they're going to come to infinity. Okay? But that can't be true in physical physics, in real old style classical physics, because if you have a wavelength, if you have a wavelength, and you keep making the nodes get infinitely long, the wavelength would be zero. And we are measuring this by actual wavelengths. We actually have wavelengths. So these have these calculations, and they get closer and closer and closer to one. But I'm saying that they actually come to an actual limit. OK? Now, they get too close to distinguish. You couldn't tell the difference by applying the first and the second method, you can get them. But if you work from the other way, from my way, you can get double, triple, exponentially more information about every element, especially the non-hydrogen ones, hydrogen-like, which are currently a failing model using Ryberg. Now, the current system has Ryberg and Bohr, then there's a slight adjustment up moving from the point equations to actual physical distance for the Dirac monopoles, which I discuss in other papers. And then those lines split. And I'm actually gonna show you that this model tells you even about that shift. Now, what happens? It is not infinity. There's waves, there's waves at one X, there's waves at two X, and 3x and 4x. So we can understand the Ryberg, 
between, say, the electron and the nucleus, okay? But what happens is, eventually, it's just like this electron has moved all the way there because you have to have a wave that allows that electron to be free and rotating. So if it's less than a wavelength of a radius of electron, the electron will tear apart. Now, in reality, that means that it's one there and then a whole one across. So it's really versus this electron, two thirds the distance of the standard um, a distance across an electron. So you'll find a couple areas where I have a one half and a three two and understand that that is the typical mathematics that nodes have to be covered the electron, the particle that itself is rotating and the full particle next to it. So that would be the three. Okay, now what are these distances? Well, basically if you take, uh, I saw that other factor in that previous equation, alpha here, the fine structure constant. Well, what is that? Well, if you take this distance and you divide it by this radius, it's not quite to scale, that difference is 18,778, which is 137.05992 squared. And that number is called the fine structure constant. And it's squared because a radio electrostatic is one over distance squared, okay? And that becomes one over alpha squared. So now I have a model for the limits of the equation that also tells me about why electrons settle at a certain distance. So now what I'm doing differently than Ryberg is I'm saying that element I may be at this distance in subshell X, but element B may be at a different distance and element C may be at a different distance. But guess what happens? No matter what those distances are, those wavelengths get smaller and smaller and smaller until they get this physical limits, three halves times R uh, sub E. So that means that the Riber constant is true for every element, but with a minor adjustment because this distance here, this starting distance in that ratio may not be the 18,778 or fine structure constant squared. It will be other numbers. So the nodes have a physical limit that applies to every. That's why all the Riber constants are very similar because they're based upon this. So first, how am I going to calculate that? First, you have to understand what a poly pair is, okay? A poly pair is one electron. The next electron wants to be as far away from it as possible, but it still has to have a net two force of radial electrostatic attraction and extra one over repulsion that basically normally for a one electron hydrogen would be the Bohr hydrogen radius, okay? So there's an inward, and an outward. Now, that calculation is that you're missing that extra one over R, one over two far away is eight, but eight minus the one gets you eight sevenths. So the actual effective distance of a poly pair is eight sevenths times the, the R sub E, or the A sub O, all right? And then of course you have to then get the sets of pairs after that by the cube root because you're doing a, a push out volume of one or two, then four, then six, okay? And I'm going to work only in pairs because we have to have that balance or that axis of symmetry and a whole bunch of other things don't work unless you get a pair. So that means quantum numbers and everything you are is hemispherical coordinates. Two first two electrons go to the two poles, subshell S. Then they build up in longitudinal rings, subshell D, uh, uh, P, subshell D, subshell F, from pole to equator, getting more and more because they all want to be pulled towards the poles and they all want to be pulled to that balance of radial electrostatic inward and that extra one over R repulsion. 
So that means that this ratio, what I had of 18778, gets this 8 sevenths poly pair, and I refine the ratio to 18, 000, uh, 21,461. Now, you can actually go see, um, read closely into uh, the Nobel Prize of Raman about spectrum, that it becomes inelastic at a number that includes the calculation of 8 sevenths. He did not apply the physical logic that I did, but he used that same ratio to determine the Raman spectrum. Raman spectrum is used in physics labs and all over the place. Now, the next thing happens is that, what is happening to that? Well, basically you have an electron out here that can rotate. That electron is a free particle and it has an anisotropic force. That means a force towards those axes. So it changes as it rotates. So if it rotates, it has to have, going at the speed of light, a harmonic that lets it go, whoop, doodum, doodum, doodum. It's, like a, it's like a slightly off bicycle wheel. So it goes a little bit in, a little bit out. Now that creates a little tiny adjustment because effectively what happens is you have an entanglement node at distance minus r over three, and distance plus r over three, which becomes distance squared minus r over three. Now this is entirely immaterial. At um, 18,000, that would be 352 millions, okay? 0. 0.000003 difference, okay? So it's no wonder that Ryberg 100 years ago didn't do this adjustment and everybody thought of n over two squared as appropriate but I'm going to get that as the electron distance squared minus radial sub is squared, and I'm gonna have that much error. And I think hopefully everyone can live with that much error when you're calculating spectrum. I can't tell the difference in light of if their spectrum is that much different. Now, so what is my definition of the Ryberg constant, which I'm gonna convert from Ryberg infinity to Ryberg at the radius edge. And these are not that much different, but that means it is the three halves and that three halves is creating a sphere, so it's cubed. And I'm comparing it to the extra one over R versus the poly pair at distance two. So I get the eight sevenths, okay? And I get the three over two and then I take the half because I'm going to take that um, Ryberg constant of squared for the harmonic node at d minus r sub e and d times d plus r sub e, so it's like the squared. And so we're going to get r sub e times, that comes out to 189 over 64, and that equals r sub e times 2.95 to the square root. And guess what? I just did that calculation here. And the experimental value for a hydrogen atom is that. And the difference is, guess what? Different out there at the eighth additions. And remember on my last screen, I had this R minus R logic that there was no way I can even get to three. And so at this point, I'm off 98, but there is a few more steps called the... Uh, and all moment squared and some other things that will do that. Now, that's great, but I only did one. Nobody's gonna believe a proof with only one thing. Now what happens? Now I'm gonna take hydrogen deuterium, but guess what? You've got a proton and an electron, but now this distance to the electron is different for each of those. The center of electrostatic, I'm gonna assume the black is the, proton, the purple is the electron, and the white is the neutron, neutron, the neutral, okay? So the electrostatic balance is there. The center of this extra one over R, so I'm going to call this extra static force, radial electrostatic, um, extra static, that's the one over distance cubed, is going to be between the two particles because both of them have the second attribute, which we call the mass attribute, this one has zero charge, that one has a charge, but both of them have a mass, which I believe is related. 
So now what happens is this one's here and this one's here and the combined center is somewhere in the middle, sort of halfway in between. So what happens is if I have electron over here, that calculation is going to be slightly different than for the electron over there because that distance is slightly offset. We have um, what in advanced physics they call um, a symmetry breaking, okay? Because it wouldn't seem to be, but that's because the center of these attributes is in different places and thereby the center of the system is minus one half and plus one half, or for this one, you might even consider it plus one half and plus one. So what happens is, and if you remember back here, you get electrons on one poly pair and the opposite poly pair gets a little tiny adjustment up and down based upon this physical model that the items can't do that. So that electron has to have two calculations, this for the one electron and this is the poly pair, but the distances and thereby that ratio of the Ryberg distance, because it's the average distance, versus this three halves of the radius squared, and the half again plus minus one half and minus one half. The same happens with tritium. Tritium, though, has all three of the same and doesn't have a splitting of lamb shift. So now I have a physical, phys a physical model that talks about what these fields are, okay? We have the proterium and the deuterium, and we have this calculation that's used in the quark model that basically adds a third and minus a third to get computed values. So now, what happens if I apply this one over distance fourth to the versus one over the distance three? I can predict what these lamb shifts are. So now for deuterium, I'm going to come up with a 50772, and guess what it is? It's 50772. I can do the tritium calculation, and it's, look at that, 1134, very different, okay? 11507, 113. But if you think about that, it makes sense because now the tritium has these bigger spreads of the poles, so that makes that electron slightly further away because those two proton, uh, the two neutrons are on each side, thereby repelling it a little bit, even though they don't provide the pull in of the radial electrostatic, but they do increase the extra one over R, the extra static repulsion. So you basically add in the anomalous moment of the electron and the anomalous moment of the proton but understood as a hemisphere, thereby using the Compton radius instead of the exact radius. Now, as such, and this is the fun part, I can do something that's non-hydrogen. So now if you look at the building of these things, I can take, again, I'm gonna use these Bohr radius, okay? But the problem is that these electrons are going to settle at different distances because of this radial electrostatic, that's the attraction, and the extra one over R repulsion. But now I've got the distances as 2.66, okay, a of units of uh, Bohr, and that electron is over at the five, that's double that, okay? And so, and then some equatorial ones, because there's five, two at each pole, then a boron has three, which are spread out across the things. Subshell 1s1, 1s2, 2, and this is an equatorial 2, 2, because they can't fill out. This is not an octet. This octet rule only applies when you can get to the correct model, which would be 1 plus 3 in one hemisphere, 1 plus 3. That's two very stable tetrahedrons, which when interlinked becomes a cube or the octet, okay? But I chose boron because it is very different. And so I can get 
the Z axis, okay, the uh, subshell S direction to balance. And I can get the equatorial, which will be this row plane, okay, um, in hemispherical or Bose cylinder surface logic, okay. And thereby, I get an average of those electrons. So that sphere that's repelling stuff is 1.48 further away. Now, if you take NIST and the official diagrams and you take the most popular, okay, runs, you can see here's the, uh, here is the um, reference electrons, okay? And so for those, the hydrogen is a 12, the boron is at 18 for the Ryberg constant, and the difference is 1.50 or 1.45, okay? Very close to what we need. So as a result, you now basically have a model to do all elements, not just the hydrogen light. And this is not in the textbook, okay? So now you can sum up the actual number of nucleons doing this mass production versus the electron production. And I have a path to do all of these other things and basically to understand that the scaling of these strengths is Planck's constant times the speed of light, which is how much the nodes and those waves have to do, matching up to this universal scaling process, which is R sub E over A sub O, particle edge over Bohr H radius, okay? And in this case, it's to the fourth because it's an extra one over R field, but then you have to scale it versus the one over distance cubed field of that. So you end up with these three fourths and you'll find these mass units of three fourths and one halves and three halves based upon the comparison of these two forces all the time. So what does that get you? That gets you things like the mass of a neutron, okay? The mass of the neutron would be this sixth then, okay? That's the one over distance cubed, then squared, okay? Times two thirds, okay? And when you add in the anomalous moment, 1.1059, 1.001, there's an O there, sorry, I typed it wrong. Um, you're within that much of there. And remember that this fine structure constant is the square root of this ratio. So fine structure constant squared is this ratio that I'm using right there as the basis, not just for Ryberg, but that same item, the R sub E and the A sub O, okay? I use Ryberg only for the limit and I use this for mass. So now I have an understanding of what mass is. Okay, so there's a lot that I did here. Okay, so it's not just about a record, but it's giving us a clue into what is mass. Mass is this R sub E over the sixth, but it scales based upon a position and field at the rate of three quarters versus that, I, that uh, scaling distance. So now one by one in my future work, I'm going to understand mass, and I'm gonna understand these symmetry and symmetry breaking to do all of the lamb ships. And of course, I'm gonna to have to do Dirac, which is the step in the middle to get that correct. But what I think I've shown here is that it's not R sub infinity, it's, R sub, uh, it's Ryberg at R sub E is the limit for every element. And two, that it's not the squares one over n1 squared minus one over n2 squared only for integers, but rethinking that as the inside and the outside for integer rotation rates based upon the set in that molecule. So it's one over n squared, but minus this tiny adjustment for R sub e, a tiny correction for that. Thank you.